Welcome to Gospel Commission. I hope you're blessed in the Lord today. In this video, we want to ask the question, how does the church relate with Israel? Are they this, is, is the church the same thing as Israel? Is it completely separate? What is the relationship of the New Covenant church, body of Christ, with the Old Testament Israel? We're looking at this in light of different theological systems that we've been considering, Hebraic roots, uh, dispensationalism, covenant theology, and we've also been trying to understand how, as a Christian, as disciples of Jesus Christ, should we read the Old Testament. Now, we've summarized that we should read the New Testament in one way. We should read it in context, trying to understand what the apostles are trying to teach. But the Old Testament is read in two different ways. We read it, one, in context, historically, understanding what was going on at the time and what the original readers understood. But also we read it prophetically through the lens of Jesus Christ, that we see him, his kingdom, and his salvation prophesied in the Old Testament. That though the Old Testament uh, prophets didn't understand exactly what they were saying, they didn't understand it was a mystery to them. In the New Testament, in Luke chapter 24, starting in verse 44, Jesus opens the minds of the apostles to understand the Old Testament. So today we're going to focus in on how is the church related to Israel. Now, as we looked at the three different theological systems, the one that actually gets closest to the biblical model is surprisingly going to be the Hebraic roots model. Now, I'm sure in the Hebraic roots camp and in, in that movement, there's a lot of debate about this, but of the teachers in the Hebraic roots movement that I've listened to, usually they have the idea that the promises were made in the Old Testament to the to Israel, uh, to the Old Testament Israel, but they are now include Gentiles. Gentiles can be grafted into Israel in the New Testament. This is, of course, why they argue and say that so we should also be obeying the Old Testament law, which is completely false and what's Paul argued against throughout his ministry. We see it in Galatians and just about everywhere. He's arguing against the fact of the Judaizers that were saying that people in the body of Christ needed to keep the laws of Moses. They needed to keep the uh, circumcision and all the other laws that were peculiar to the law of Moses. So they're not right in that, but they are right in the fact that Israel received the promises and now those promises are continued on in the new covenant and Gentiles can be grafted in to Israel. Now let's look at Jeremiah chapter 31 and we see this is the promise. So the new covenant is for the people of Israel. 31, surely the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. It will not be according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt because they broke my covenant Although I was a husband to them, says the Lord, but this is the this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law within their in them and write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. They shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sins no more. So we see, first of all, that he's speaking to Israel, to the house of Israel and the house of Judah, so that means the, the whole people of Israel, and he's giving them promise of a new covenant that will be different than the covenant that was made with the people that came out of Israel. Now we see something interesting here, that he's going to write his law on their heart, and that each of them are going to know the Lord. See, in the old covenant, they had priests and, and they had prophets that you had to go and you had to learn and be taught to know the Lord. Because in the old covenant, they did not all have the spirit of God. So they did not all know the Lord. But Jesus says, this is eternal life to know the one true God and Jesus Christ whom he has sent. So in the new covenant, when somebody repents and turns from their rebellion against God and they trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, they're reconciled to God and they receive the spirit of God. And so then they know God. They're are walking with God. And so though we have teachers in the body of Christ, though there is preaching and all kinds of things that we learn from the Bible, we're not teaching other Christians to know the Lord because they already know the Lord. We're teaching them to grow in their knowledge and grace of, of Jesus Christ. And so it's different than what we're teaching the unbelievers, those that are not in the new covenant. We're teaching them to know the Lord, to be reconciled to God through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. So we see here that the law is going to be written on their hearts. We see in Ezekiel chapter... 36, I believe, verse 27, we see that, that God is going to give us a new heart. He's going to circumcise our old heart, take out the old stony heart, and give us a new heart of flesh that will obey the commands of God. And that's what we see happening in the New Testament, that we receive the law of God, which is love God and love your neighbor, and that by the Spirit of God, we can walk that out. So here's where the dilemma begins. And this is the dilemma that Paul was trying to explain in, in 
several of his letters, Ephesians, uh, Galatians, and Romans. He's trying to explain how is it that if God promised the new covenant to Israel, but in, in Paul's day, in the time of the New Testament, most of the Jewish people rejected Messiah and rejected the new covenant. If that's the case, doesn't that ruin God's plan? Because he made a promise to give them a new covenant, but because of their unbelief, then they're not, they don't enter into that new covenant. So what's the deal with that? If we turn to Romans chapter 9, we will see that that's what Paul is dealing with in Romans chapter 9. This has often been used as a, a proof text for uh, determinism, but it has nothing to do with that. It has to do with what Paul was dealing with. He was dealing with those that were uh, Judaizers and also with unbelieving Jews that were claiming that their ancestry gave them a right to, uh, the, the, new co- or to the new covenant, and they were saying that this Jesus is not the one. So they were rejecting Messiah. So let's look at verses 1 through 5. I am speaking the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience testifies with me in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and continual anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accursed from Christ, from my brethren, my kinsmen by race, who are Israelites, to whom belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the service of God, and the promises, to whom belong the patriarchs, and from whom, according to the flesh, is Christ, who is over all, God forever blessed. Amen. So he's grieving over the fact that the majority of the Israelites had rejected Messiah and they had rejected the new covenant. And so this is something he's grieved because actually the scriptures were given to them. The promises were given them. Promises like we just read in Jeremiah chapter 31. If we jump back to Romans chapter 3, we read this starting in verse Uh, Starting in verse 1, what advantage then does the Jew have or what profit is there in circumcision much in every way, chiefly because the oracles of God were entrusted to them. So what's the benefit of being Jewish? If salvation is both for Jew and Gentile, what was the benefit for being Jewish? It says primarily that they were given the oracles of God. So they had knowledge of the who the living God was, who the creator was and what his plan for humanity was. Verse 3, what if some did not believe? So what if... What if the Jews rejected Messiah and the new covenant? What if some did not believe? Would their unbelief nullify the faithfulness of God? In other words, would the unbelief of the Jews ruin the plan of God? And and verse 4 says, God forbid, let God be true and every man a liar, as it is written, that you may be justified in your words and may prevail in your judgment. So he's saying, even though they rejected Messiah, even though they rejected the new covenant, that doesn't mean that the plan of God has been thwarted. We see it if we jump back to Romans chapter 9, after his grief over Israel and bringing up the fact that, you know, they have rejected Messiah and they've rejected the promises. He goes on in verse 6. And he says this, because the next question would be then, if that's the case, then the plan of God is ruined. And so verse 6 says this, it is not as though the word of God has failed. So Paul's trying to say that, yes, God made promises to Israel. And yes, Israel, the large percentage of them did not believe. And so they rejected those promises. But this has not ended the plan and the promise of God. But how can this be? He goes on to say in the second part of verse 6, for they are not all Israel who are descended from Israel. So what is he saying here? They are not all part of the Israel of God. They're not part of God's holy people, Israel, who are just because they are descended from Jacob. So it's not because they are from Jacob who was called Israel because they have that natural lineage. Not because of that are they part of the Israel of God. And so he's going to make an argument uh, throughout uh, the rest of this chapter, particularly in verses seven through nine. We can look here. He says, nor are they all children because they are descendants of Abraham, but in Isaac, your descendants shall be called. So those who are the children of the flesh are not the children of God, but the children of promise are counted as descendants. For this is the word of promise. At this time, I will come and Sarah shall have a son. So it's not through lineage from Jacob. And he goes on in verse seven and says, nor is it from lineage from Abraham, because we know that Abraham had Ishmael and he was not accepted as uh, the descendant, uh, he was not accepted as the one that would receive the promise. He also, then I- Isaac had uh, Jacob and Esau, but Esau was not the one to receive the promise. So the argument here is this, is not everybody that is born and descended from Abraham is going to be a child and receive the promise that was given to Abraham. What is that promise? That he would be the heir of all nations. He said, I'll make of you a great nation. And from that nation, I will bless all the nations of the earth. So we're, we're here asking the question, so 
Look in verse, uh, look in verse eight. So those who are the children of the flesh are not the children of God. So who would the children of the flesh be? Those that were naturally descended. Remember, Paul has been talking about the fact that the Jews rejected, the large percentage of them rejected Messiah. That didn't ruin God's plan because God doesn't count his people Israel according to natural lineage. That's what he's saying here. But the children of promise are counted as descendants. So we must ask, who are these children of promise? If we jump back to Romans chapter 4, we read it here. Romans chapter 14. How does somebody become a child of prophet? If it's, if it's not through lineage, if it's not because we're born from Jacob, from the line of Jacob, then how does one become a child of promise? How does one become a child of Abraham? How does one receive this blessing and the promises that were given in the old covenant to the house of Israel? How does one become part of Israel that receives the promises? Verse 16, therefore the promise comes through faith so that it might be by grace that the promise would be certain to all the descendants, not only to those who are of the law, but also those who are of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. As it said in verse 13, it was not through the law that Abraham and his descendants received the promise that he would be heir of the world, but through the righteousness of faith. For if those who are of the law are become heirs, faith would be made void and the promise nullified because the law produces wrath for there where there is no law, there is no sin. Therefore, the promise comes through faith. So how do we become children of Abraham? We become children of Abraham, not by just being born of a natural lineage, but through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, as it said over in chapter four, verse 23. Now the words it was credited to him were not written for his sake only, but also for us to whom it is credited if we believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered for our transgressions and was raised up for our justification. So through faith in Jesus Christ, we become the children of Abraham. We become the children of promise. And in the context of Romans chapter nine, that means we become the Israel of God and also the children of God because we're born again as God's children through faith. As verse eight said, Romans nine, eight. So those those who are the children of the flesh are not the children of God. Who are those children of the flesh? Those that are only born naturally, as Paul was talking about in verse 1 through 5. They're born naturally, but they rejected Messiah. They are not the children of God. Only those that receive Christ through faith are the children of God. Let's flip over to uh, uh, Galatians chapter 4. Now, if you followed any of the teaching on Calvinism, then you've heard a lot of this before, but it's important that we understand the reason we deal with this passage is so much when we're dealing with uh, Calvinism is because if we use them to teach determinism, then we don't understand exactly what they are trying to teach, what Paul is actually explaining to us. So we need to understand these things. So if we turn over to Galatians chapter 4, and let's see here. Galatians chapter 4, look at verse 21. Now, Paul's going to use an allegory. He's going to talk about Ishmael and Hagar, and he's going to talk about Isaac and Sarah. And he's going to tell us that this is an analogy between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant, those that live according to the law and those that live through faith. So I'm just going to read it here. Tell me, you who desire to be under the law, do you not hear the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by the slave woman, the other by the free woman. But he who is a slave woman was born according to the flesh, as it said in Romans chapter uh, 9, uh, those, those that are according to the flesh are not the children of God. But he of the free woman through the promise. So by Sarah was the woman of promise, through Hagar was the woman uh, of the flesh. 24, these things are an allegory for these are the two covenants. The one is from Mount Sinai, which gives birth to bondage. She is Hagar. Now this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and represents the present Jerusalem and is in bondage with her children. So how are they in bondage? They were in bondage because they were in bondage to the law of Moses. And it, the, not that the law of Moses is bad, but when you reject Jesus Christ and choose the law of Moses, that is bondage because there is no salvation in the law. There is only salvation in Jesus Christ. Verse 26, but the Jerusalem, which is above is free, which is our mother. Jump to first. 28. Now we brothers like Isaac are the children of promise, but as it was then he who was born after the flesh persecuted him who was born after the spirit. So it is now also. So in the same way that Ishmael persecuted uh, Isaac, 
So in Paul's day, many of the unbelieving Jews were persecuting the church and causing it to spread, and they were persecuting Paul himself. Even Paul, before he was saved, was a, a member, and he was all of, of national Israel that was also persecuting the church. Verse 30, nevertheless, what does the scripture say? Cast out the slave woman and her son, for the slave woman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. So here what we have, oh, verse sorry, 31. So then, brothers, we are not children of the slave woman, but of the free woman. So what we have here is Paul teaching that though people were descended from Israel naturally, though they were from the line of Jacob, if they reject Christ, they would be rejected and cast out and have no inheritance in Israel. If they rejected Christ, they're rejecting the new covenant and all the promises that were given to, uh, to Israel. But if the Gentiles who were not given that promise, if they believe in the Jewish Messiah, if they accept him and submit to him as the Lord of all, then through that they are grafted into Israel and they become the children of promise. They become Isaac, even though some that were descended from Isaac naturally but rejected Messiah were cast out. How can this be? Let's go back to Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3, verse 15. Brothers, I am speaking to you in human terms, though it is only a man's covenant. Yet, if it is ratified, no one annuls it or adds to it. Now, the promises were made to Abraham and his seed. He does not say, and to seeds, meaning many, but and to your seed, meaning the one who is Christ. Now, it's important to understand what Paul's argument was in Romans 9. He says, look, not everybody who's born from Abraham is going to be a child of promise. And even those that are born of Isaac are not going to be a child of promise uh, because Ishmael or uh, Esau was born from Isaac, but it's only Jacob that receives the promise. So he's saying it's not the, uh, he's saying this, God is, has the right to limit who receives the promise. So first he gives the promise to Abraham and then he limits it only to Isaac's line, not to Ishmael's line. Then God limits it again when it comes to Esau and Jacob. He says, oh, it's only going to be through Jacob. It's not going to be through Esau. And so now what we see in the new covenant is God is doing once again what he has the prerogative to do. He is limiting which uh, line the salvation and the blessings and the promises of the old covenant come through. Namely, they come through the line of Jesus Christ. So the seed, the one who received the promise is Jesus Christ. He is the seed, the one seed. Verse 17, and this I say, that the law which came 430 years later does not annul the covenant that was ratified by God in Christ so as to nullify the promise. So the promise given to Abraham was actually given to Jesus Christ. And those that are in Jesus Christ will be part of the children of Abraham, part of the Israel of God and receive the promises. But those that reject Jesus Christ, even though they are from Isaac, even though they are from Jacob, even though they are from Abraham by natural lineage, it does not matter. Even if they keep the law of Moses, that does not matter because the the law came after the promise and it doesn't wash away the promise but the promise is fulfilled in the seed Jesus Christ verse 30 or verse 18 for if the inheritance comes through the law it no longer comes through the promise but God gave it to Abraham through promise now again how do we enter into this look at verse 26 you are all sons of God by faith in Christ Jesus for as many as you were baptized into Christ have put on Christ so how do we become the lineage that comes through Messiah not by being born, not by a natural lineage, but through faith. Because when we place our trust in Jesus Christ, we become the children of God. Remember, Romans 9, 8 said, it's not those that are born according to the flesh that are the children of God, but it's those that are born according to the spirit, those that are born according to faith, we become the children of God. So you are all sons of God by faith in Christ Jesus. Verse 27, for as many as of you have been baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. We identify with Christ. Verse 28, Therefore, there is there neither Jew nor Greek, there's neither slave nor free, and there's neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So all the promises of God about the new covenant, not the Old Testament. The Old Testament had laws like do not eat this, do not touch that. And then it had promises. You'll inherit this land. You, you'll defeat your enemies. You will have great crops. Okay, that was all part of the old covenant. But that old covenant, God promised Israel he was going to make a new and different covenant. And this new and different covenant was going to have God's law written on our hearts. It was going to be a new form of the law that was going to be the righteous requirements of the law, as it says in Romans chapter 8, verse 3, and, and uh, I believe in... Uh, Romans chapter 2, verse 26. And so the new covenant 
is going to be different than the old. But how do we become part of the new covenant? It's not only through natural lineage, but it's through faith in Jesus Christ. Whether Jew or Gentile, we can be part of the Israel of God. If there is someone who is Jewish by natural descent, but they reject Christ, they will be cut off and they will not have an inheritance. They will be like the slave woman's son who was cast off from the inheritance, like Esau who sold his birthright for a bit of porridge. If they cling to the law and they reject Christ, then they're selling their birthright and they're, they're being rejected. But if they are children of promise, that they believe in the gospel and they trust in Jesus Christ, then they will be grafted into Israel and the new covenant will belong to them. This is what the, the scripture is teaching. We can see this uh, further if we go into uh, Romans chapter 11. We see that the, the people of God is an olive tree and that those that believe among Jew or Gentile are in. Those that are naturally Jewish that believe, they stay right in their natural olive tree because the Jewish Messiah was promised to them and they receive it through faith. But then those that don't receive will be grafted out. They will be taken out. They'll snapped off of the olive tree. And then Gentiles who are not from the natural olive tree will be grafted in through faith. And they will remain in there as long as they continue to trust in Christ, as it says in Romans chapter 11. So we see that the Israel of God, it's... It, it has a, a, an important connection with the church. So let's put it this way. So what about dispensationalism? Dispensationalism says, here's Israel, and then the church is completely different and completely distinct. That is not true. So we can say this, the church is Israel. In what way can we say it? Because Israel was a type and a shadow of what the church was going to be. And now the church is the fulfillment of, of what was prophesied, the promise of this new covenant that all the nations would hope in Christ, that through, through, through Abraham's seed, all the nations would be blessed. Through Jesus Christ, all nations would be blessed. So whenever uh, dispensationalism separates the church and, and Israel so far apart, they are not going according to scripture because the church is the fulfillment of the promises given in the Old Testament about the New Testament to come to Israel. But on the other hand, Covenant theology tries to make the church uh, and Israel exactly the same. They say that Israel was always the church. That's not true. It was only a type and a shadow. It was only a national, uh, a national people that were in one part and one. It wasn't salvation in the same way that we have it. So we can say it this way. The church is Israel, but Israel is not the church. National Israel is not the church, but the church is the fulfillment of the type and shadow, which was the Old Testament Israel. So we need to understand that both dispensationalism and covenant theology are both wrong and right. There is a continuation from the Old Testament to the New, and there is also a discontinuation because the Old Testament is fulfilled in Christ, but this is a different thing. This is a different covenant. It, it, it's totally different. It's a reconstituted Israel. When Israel was originally constituted, they were constituted according to a bloodline and according to the law of Moses. If you were in the people and you kept the law of Moses, or even if you were outside of the people and you came and you were circumcised and came into the people and kept the law of Moses, you would be part of Israel. Now it is no longer through law, it is no longer through lineage, but we are counted as the Israel of God through faith in Jesus Christ, the seed. We trust in him. We don't go back and obey the Old Testament law of Moses. No, we follow the law of Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ himself. It's not through natural lineage, but it's through spiritual lineage, trusting in Jesus Christ and receiving his spirit. That's why it says, if you are Christ, then you are, you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Now, one more thing, let me throw in real quick before we, we jump out here, is that, is that we see that in the Old Testament, somebody was saved through trusting in God. When they placed their trust in God, they were justified. As Abraham was justified when he believed God, it was counted to him as righteousness. But they were sanctified through the law of Moses. It was the law of Moses that was given to them and told them, do this and walk according to this. This will be your wisdom in the sight of the nations. This will be your righteousness if you do these laws. Of course, they couldn't keep it fully because they were flesh. They were without the spirit. And so they would see the law, say that it's good, but they would continue to fail. So the Old Testament salvation being justified is the same as in the new. But the difference is in the new covenant, we're not only justified through faith and we're not only uh, saved by grace and reconciled to God through grace, but we're also sanctified by grace and that the spirit of God comes to dwell in us and we receive a new heart and a new spirit and the law of God is written in our heart so that we can live according to the law of Christ, which is to love God and to love your neighbor as yourself. Uh, one more thing. 
I know it's gone quite long, but we'll go ahead and jump into it. If we turn over to Matthew chapter 8, this is very important to understand because you think, well, maybe this is just Paul, you know, getting confused, or maybe, you know, Chris is just confused about what Paul is saying. Let's go to Matthew chapter 8 because this was, though those in the Mid-Acts Dispensationalist group will say, oh, Paul said something different than, than Jesus and the apostles, and, and, and Jesus and the apostles never talked about uh, the Gentiles, you know, no, that's not true. Uh, the, the Gospels tell us much that salvation is going to be for the Gentiles. Let's read it here uh, in chapter 8, Matthew 8, verse uh, 10. When Jesus heard it, speaking to a uh, about a centurion, uh, sol uh, centurion uh, soldier, he was amazed and said to those who followed, Truly I say to you, I have not found such great faith, no, not in Israel. And I say to you that many will come from the east and the west and dine with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the sons of the kingdom, that's the natural Jews who reject Messiah, but the sons of the kingdom will be thrown out into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So Jesus was already speaking about the fact that Israel was going to be reconstituted around faith. This man had great faith, and so he would be part of the Israel of God. But those uh, Jewish men and the Pharisees, that they had the law of Moses, they had the lineage, they said, we are children of Abraham, and Jesus said, no, you're children of the devil in John chapter 8, because they rejected Messiah, so they were cut off, and they were no longer part of the Israel of God. But we also see it if we go over to, Matthew has a lot to say about this, Jesus in Matthew, I should say. If we turn over to uh, Matthew chapter 21, we read the parable the parable of the vineyard and vine dressers that God, the, the, vine, the parable means this. God continually sent prophets to the people of Israel. They continue to reject. Finally, he sent his son and they still rejected him. What will be the result of that? Verse 40, therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to the vine dressers? Jesus asked the Pharisees. They said he will severely destroy those wicked men and rent his vineyard to other vine dressers and who will give him the fruits in their season. So he says he's going to get... This is their answer. They know what the parable means. Verse 42, But Jesus said to them, Have you never read the scriptures? The stone which the builder rejected has become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Jesus is the cornerstone. God's people are determined by how they relate with Jesus Christ, not by their lineage, and not by the, how they relate with the law of Moses, but how they relate with Jesus Christ. He is the cornerstone Israel has been reconstituted around Jesus Christ. That's how we become part of Israel. That's how we receive the new covenant. We come into the promises given to Israel because we become the children of Abraham. Verse 43, Therefore I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken from you and given to a nation bearing its fruit. Whoever falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, but on whomever it falls, it will crush him. So Jesus was telling the Jews of his day, if they did not receive him, then they would be rejected. But anybody that would receive him would be brought into the promises of Israel, including the promises of the new covenant in Jeremiah chapter 31, that he would give us a new spirit, write his law on our heart, and that we would know the Lord. And eternal life is to know the one true God in Jesus Christ whom he sent. Hope this has been helpful to you. God bless.